I'm enormously grateful that you take the seriousness of the challenge that we face as Americans uh, um, enough to put aside a couple hours on a Saturday to come talk about this issue. So I have just one sacred text. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil. Henry David Thoreau, 1846, on Walden. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. So imagine a letter written by a young girl. There were two clocks regulating our life, the one on the wall and the one in the bottle. We built our life around those two clocks. He slept late, so mornings were bliss. We could play and laugh without fear. But at some point, he would awake. And after he woke, the bottle was opened. And then the older the day grew, the more terrifying life became. He was happy at first, just before dinner, the most happy. That's the only time I spoke to him, a moment that I could pretend that I had a father who had a feeling of love. He'd smile, he would laugh, but soon he'd grow irritated, and by the end of dinner, he was angry. And if we were not gone, usually just hiding in our room, by nine, he would be violent. He hit me more than once. Once he tried to do something worse than hitting me, and I left, and I never went back. We struggled to do many things then, to keep food in the house, to keep winter out of the house, to keep the house. But we never even spoke about getting him to stop. I don't know why. The bottle was just part of our life. We learned to live with it. Anything more just seemed impossible to us. Now the thing about us, all of us, us humans, is that we adapt. We adjust, we learn to live with it until we can't. And then like a fever, something breaks out, and if it's hopeful, it is a Thoreauvian moment, a moment where we look at the branches we've been hacking at and look instead to a root. We become root strikers. <clears throat> So there's a feeling today, I think, among too many of us, too many of us Americans, that we might just not make it. Not that the end is near or the doom is around the corner, but that a distinctly American feeling of inevitability, of greatness, culturally, economically, or politically, is gone. That we've become Britain, or Rome, or Greece. This sense of failure, is deep and profound, and it cuts across political boundaries. Now, a generation ago, Ronald Reagan rallied the nation to deny a similar charge by Jimmy Carter, Carter's worry that we had fallen into a state of malaise. And I confess, I was one of those so rallied back then, and I still believe Reagan was right, but the feeling I'm talking about is not Reagan's charge. It's not that we as a people have lost anything of our potential, but that we as a republic have. That our capacity for governing, the product and part of a constitution that we have revered for more than two centuries has come to an end, that the thing that we were once most proud of, this, our republic, is the one thing that we all have learned to ignore. Government has become an embarrassment. It has lost the capacity to make the most essential decisions and slowly it dawns on us that a ship that cannot be steered is a ship that will sink. This is not a democratic or republican point alone. This frustration is multi-partisan. The sense that the government doesn't work is a sense shared by all Americans because there are many issues on the left and the right that systematically get blocked despite the electoral victories of those who otherwise ought to prevail. And in this moment, we have to seek this Thoreauvian route. Now, my job tonight is to convince you, to brainwash you a little bit of, about what exactly might be this Thoreauvian route. So I have some examples to walk you through. The first 
recounts a fight that I had for many years in my life, as described by Eric, around the issues of copyright. I became a copyright activist on October 27th, 1998, when President Clinton signed into law a statute honoring this great American, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Now this was a statute that extended the terms of existing copyrights by 20 years. And the question Congress was supposed to ask when it passed that statute was, did such an extension advance the public good? Because of course, extending the term of future copyrights, in theory, might create more incentives to produce great new works, in theory. But the thing we know about incentives is that they're prospective only, not in the world of Star Trek, but in our world, incentives are prospective only. Not even the United States Congress can get George Gershwin to do anything more. <laughs> so when this statute was passed and we challenged it in the Supreme Court and we got some economists to join with us in a brief to say that this could not possibly advance the public good, this left-wing economist, oh, I'm sorry, wait, this is Milton Friedman, right-wing, <laughs> Nobel Prize winning economist, agreed to sign the brief only if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. <laughs> so obvious was it that it could not advance the public good to extend the term of existing copyrights. Yet apparently there were no brains here when Congress unanimously extended the term of existing copyrights. What there was was more than $6 million in campaign contributions from Disney-related corporations to drive to a conclusion that would benefit them at the expense of a public good. Here's another example. Wall Street Journal was puzzled last January um, in an article they, uh, they wrote about the extent of the, the temporary tax code. Temporary tax code means the provisions in the tax code which are set to expire. And as they expire, they get extended. And as they get extended, there is what the journal called extender mania. Meaning, as this provision's about to disappear, there's a frantic drive to get it extended once again. And the question the journal asked, and it's an interesting question given the rise of these temporary provisions, is what explains this explosion in extender mania? Now, the first of these temporary tax provisions was actually an idea of Reagan or Reagan's staffers. In 1981, Congress passed the Research and Development Tax Credit, but it was controversial. And it was therefore made temporary in a bargain with the Democrats to ask the question after a number of years whether it worked. And the idea was if the economists said it didn't work, they'd repeal it. But if the economists said it did work, they would make it permanent. And the answer was after a couple of years, Democrat and Republican economists both says it did work. All of them agreed. It was a really great tax credit idea because it spurred the kind of investment that otherwise wouldn't have been invested in and therefore made sense absolutely to be part of our tax code. The puzzle is it's still temporary. To this day, it is still temporary. So why is that? Well, Rebecca Kaisar in this article in the Georgia Law Review gives us a clue. She says the principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. These business entities are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure the continuance of this large tax savings. The Institute for Policy Innovation puts the point a little bit more crassly. This cycle has been repeated for years. Congress allows the credit to lapse until another short extension is given, preceded, of course, by a series of fundraisers and speeches about the importance of nurturing innovation. Congress essentially uses this cycle to raise money for re-election, promising industry more predictability the next time around. Now this dynamic is critical and it's central to how Washington works. Well, just think about it a bit. We are architecting tax policy, not just to raise money for the federal government, but also to raise money for congressional campaigns that use the tax policy to essentially extort people into contributing to their campaigns, to make it easier to raise money, and not just tax policy. When Al Gore was vice president, his staff had an idea to change the way internet was regulated so that the disparate regulations of cable and telephone would be put onto a new Title VII, and it would be essentially deregulated, fundamentally deregulated from the way it was when he first became vice president. 
Staff took the idea to Capitol Hill. The answer from Capitol Hill was, hell no. If we deregulate these guys, how are we going to raise money from them? So you begin to think we tax in order to raise campaign contributions. We architect regulation in order to raise campaign contributions. Campaign contributions have a lot to do with the architecture and reach, conservatives should recognize, of our government today. Well, here's a third example. This is a picture of a 15-year-old boy. It's a picture of an epidemic in childhood obesity. Since 1980, we've tripled the number of kids who are obese. Now, for kids over the age of two, one-third are technically obese. Now, this epidemic, of course, has costs. The most profound kind of cost is the rise of type 2 diabetes, the sort of diabetes that used to afflict just older people. Now, in some communities, one half of the new cases come from kids. Total cost, as estimated by the Center for American Progress, is $147 billion annually in direct care costs. So why is this? What explains this change? Well, in part, at least, it has something to do with we, what we eat. There's a consensus among people who know something about the matter that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. Or actually, not technically sugar. It's that we eat too much of this stuff, high fructose corn syrup, a mixture which in 1980 no human had ever consumed. Now 40% of the products in your supermarket have high fructose corn syrup in them. What explains that rise? Well, in part, it's because of the relative costs between sugar and corn. Sugar is expensive, corn is relatively cheap. And that leads lovers of the market to say, well, that's what the market demands, that's what the market demands. But it's not quite so simple here. Sugar is expensive in America because tariffs protect the domestic sugar industry giving them at least a billion dollars in extra profits every year and costing the economy about three billion dollars in inefficiency costs because sugar costs the United, in the United States two to three times what it costs anywhere else in the world. And corn is so cheap because it's subsidized, something like 74 billion dollars in the last 15 years, leading some economists to say the cost of growing corn is actually negative so when you add these two factors together, you can begin to understand the radical shift in the cost of foods. So between 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. Cost of a Big Mac went down by 5.4%. Cost of a bottle of Coke went down by 35%. And you can understand a radical shift in how food gets made. So I'm sure many of you saw this fantastic film, Food, Inc., which tells the story of how because corn is so cheap, we can afford to feed our cattle corn rather than having them graze on grass. That's great for the factory farms that produce cattle in this way. Not so great for the cattle because it turns out, of course, that the stomachs of cows don't actually digest corn well. It kind of stews in there. And as it stews in there, bacteria grows, which of course requires tons of antibiotics to deal with the sickness that's induced by this poor food for the cattle. And of course, as you put tons of antibiotics in this mix, you begin to breed plentiful amount of bugs that are resistant to the antibiotics. And if this were a film, we'd cut to a scene of a four-year-old boy eating a hamburger and dying from the poison carried in that food. All of this because corn is so cheap, sugar is so dear. So the free marketer should say, what explains this anti-free market silliness? And there are lots of possible explanations. Presidential campaigns begin in Iowa. But it's, of course, obvious that there's endless campaign cash driving to both of these crazy conclusions. ADM has spent literally millions of dollars forcing through the subsidy of corn, not just for uh, high fructose corn syrup purposes, but also to support the ethanol industry. and the Sugar manufacturers have spent millions to continue to get the protection of tariffs to protect their domestic industry. If we can say it's because of this money, then we can say campaign money is distorting the market, which is distorting food production, which is distorting our kids' health. Or one more example, think about Wall Street. We just saw a collapse on Wall Street that triggered an extraordinary economic collapse in our society. What explains the collapse on Wall Street? Well, according to Simon Johnson and James Quack, it's something of a perverse mix, a mix of both too little government and too much government. Too little government in the form of deregulation 
In the 1990s, as an explosion of financial innovations, aka derivatives, but these innovations were invisible to the market because also in the 1990s, there was an innovation in how we regulated financial assets. The government explicitly decided to exempt derivatives from the traditional regulations that applied to financial assets since the New Deal, regulations requiring that they be traded in a public exchange transparent, transparently subject to anti-fraud requirements. So as my colleague Frank Partner calculated, in 1980, 98% of financial assets were traded subject to those traditional New Deal exchange rules. But by 2008, 90% of the assets traded in our market were traded exempted from those traditional New Deal rules. Producing this shadow banking market, which of course encouraged this bubble. But that alone was not enough, according to Quack and Johnson. In addition, we have too much government. Because through the 1990s, there was a clear beacon given by the government to everybody within the industry that there would be, in effect, a government guarantee when this bubble burst. There would be a bailout on the other side. Producing what is the dumbest form of socialism ever invented by man, socialized risk and privatized benefit. We pay the downside, they get the upside. Now, this is a technical legal term. I, a couple of lawyers, I'm sure, in the room will understand this. I apologize. But this is an insanely stupid way <laughs> to regulate a financial system. <laughs> but that's not the worst of it. All of that was before 2008. Even more astonishing is what happens after 2008 where we add insult to injury in a way that is the life of Congress now. Because after 2008, after we had seen the worst crisis since the Depression, after it was obvious to all who are not in the pay of Wall Street that one of the causes of this collapse was the mismanagement in this regulation. People on the left and right, Judge Richard Posner wrote two books pointing to the mismanagement of financial regulation here. After the dean of deregulation, Alan Greenspan, confessed in testimony to Congress that he had been, quote, mistaken about how the financial services sector would behave, believing them to behave like good people as opposed to people who are just trying to make as much money as they can. After all of these things happened, still Congress was blackmailed by the financial services sector on Wall Street into giving Wall Street a get out of jail free card and in passing a quote financial reform bill that left the core structural problem the too big to fail problem in place and now even worse. If it was too big to fail before, it is only too big and uh, to fail even more today. We are, as many argue, Johnson and Quack in particular, more at risk today of a collapse from precisely this failed architecture of regulation than we were in 2002. Now, why is it that we produce this craziness in how we regulate the system. I mean, the mistake before 2008, you might forgive by saying that zeitgeist was deregulation. But after 2008, what could explain the failure to re-regulate in a way that corrected that mistake? Well, lots of possible reasons. But the one thing we know is before 2008, the fastest growing and largest contributions came from financial sector and security sector. And in the 2010 election, the largest campaign contributions came from the financial sector and insurance sector. These two facts must be relevant to how we think about the insanity of this regulation. And one final example. I'm sure many of you, when you saw this video, thought to yourself, how is it possible that there could be such a large experimental drilling project without extensive impact, environmental impact and risk studies done? I mean, after all, in the area where I come from, we've just spent nine years and 10,000 pages of environmental impact analysis to allow us to build this clean energy in the Bay. So when companies were trying to build these structures, in particular BP building the Deepwater Horizon, how much review were they forced to do before they were allowed to launch their project? And the answer is 17 pages before they were exempted from any further environmental impact analysis. 
And when Congress heard this, Congress was, of course, shocked. I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Everybody out at once. Yet, of course, it was Congress that had required these fast-track approval proje uh, projects and exactly why Congress would acquire, require fast-track approval with experimental drilling technology, we don't know. Lots of possible reasons, but the one thing we do know is the endless stream of campaign cash supporting this decision. Now, no respectable liberal or libertarian or conservative could defend these cases. Each of them is an abomination from each of these philosophies. So how is it they come about? Now, the political scientist is uncertain. Political science is complex here. But here's the thing. You believe you know how they come about. All I have to do is point at the money. And you believe you have found a root cause. And my claim is, number one, it is because of cases like these that Americans believe that money buys results in Congress. Overwhelmingly, 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress, according to a poll we conducted at the beginning of the year. A little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control, it was the same, just reversed. So whether it's two thirds or three fourths, here's the thing we really agree upon. Money buys results in Congress. And that leads to number two. The fact that we believe this erodes our trust in this institution of Congress. Gallup found last year that 11% of Americans had confidence in Congress. Things have gotten better. Now it's 12% according to the latest poll. 12% have confidence in Congress. You should put that in some context. When the Americans fought the revolution against the British crown. It's certainly the case that there were more who had confidence in the British crown than who have confidence in our Congress today. And that leads us to ask, at what point does a political institution need to declare a political bankruptcy? At what point do we say it has just lost the confidence of the people requiring a fundamental change? But that leads to number three. This low trust erodes participation in the system. So Rock the Vote, the organization that turned out the largest number of young voters in the 2008 election, largest in the history of elections in the United States and arguably responsible for producing the victory of Barack Obama, found that in 2010, many of their constituents were not gonna vote, so they pulled them. And the number one issue, the one, number one reason given by the members of the Rock the Vote organization was no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And that's not just a view of kids. The vast majority did not vote in this last election, in part at least because of this belief. Okay, now of course, it wasn't supposed to be like this. The framers of our constitution gave us what they called a republic, but as they meant that term, a republic was to be a, quote, representative democracy. And as Federalist 52 describes, a representative democracy was to include a branch of government that was, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's their model of government. We have the people and we have the government. I do my own slides, that's really cool, right? The way that bounces. <laughs> so this marionette relationship, the government's dependent upon the people, the problem, is that Congress has evolved a different dependence. Not just a dependence upon the people, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders, the funders of campaigns. Because as members of Congress spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power, they, like any of us would, develop a sixth sense a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the terms of the X-Files, shape shifters, constantly adjusting their view, not about the first 10 top issues that they talk about in their campaigns, but about issue 111 to 1000. They become shape shifters, adjusting their view in light of what they know will raise money. Leslie Byrne describes that when she first went to Congress, she's a Democrat from Virginia, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now the point is, this is a dependence too. But it is a different and conflicting dependence from the dependence intended by our framers, a dependence upon the people alone. Because, surprise, surprise, the funders are not the people. Indeed, as anybody who's been in this business recognizes, the people who get the attention of candidates are those who max out in their contributions to the candidates. So those who give what used to be $2,400, now $2,500. The percentage of America that maxes out is 0.05% of our population. 0.05% max out. So the Occupy Wall Street movement is, is missing a real opportunity here. It's not that we are the 99%. <laughs> they are the 99.95%. <laughs> The 99.95% who do not have systematic access to this government and therefore we see the government distorting its decisions in a way that tracks this money. Now I think it should be obvious to all of us, even though not yet to the Supreme Court, that this is corruption. Right? It's not brown paper bag corruption. Right? For most of the 20th century, members of Congress had safes in their office with lots of cash. And you might think, geez, I didn't know that they paid congressmen in cash. They didn't. They just had lots of cash in those safes. I don't know why. But that's not the kind of corruption I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about Rob Lagojevich kind of corruption. <laughs> from that perspective, from that illegal quid pro quo perspective, ours is the cleanest Congress in the history of Congress. The corruption I'm talking about is a corruption of this intended dependence. It is, we could say, a dependence corruption because it is the wrong dependence from the one intended and that constitutes the corruption that we need to address. Now, if we're going to change this, we have to fix that dependence. If the problem is that the funders are not the people, the solution has got to be to make the funders the people. To give them away, that's actually two words. I don't mean to give Congress away. I know lots of people would like to do that. But to give Congress a way to fund without Faust, without selling their souls, and thereby without alienating America. And one way, maybe the only way, is to imagine establishing a system of publicly funded public elections. <laughs> A system to substitute the large dollar funded campaigns that we have right now for small dollar funded campaigns. Building on the examples of red state Arizona, red blue state Maine, blue state Connecticut. Giving candidates a chance to opt into a system where they need to take small dollar contributions only because those contributions are appropriately amplified to make it possible for them to fund winning campaigns without ever taking large contributions from anyone. Now there are lots of ways to do this, lots of different strategies for implementing the small dollar funded campaign. I describe one in my book a little different from Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut. But the point I want you to think about, to recognize, the critical point about this way of funding campaigns is that if we had a system where the vast majority of candidates just took small dollar contributions, when Connecticut launched their system, 88% of candidates and incumbents opted into the system in the first year. So if we had something even close, 70% of candidates opting into the system, taking small dollar contributions only, then we could all believe, as we all want to believe, <laughs> that when Congress did something stupid, it might have been because there are too many Democrats or too many Republicans, but the one reason that wouldn't race to the top of our list was because of the money, because that alternative system would have removed the fundamental reason why we are so deeply cynical about what this Congress does. This is a way to change this system, to make it a system where the people are once again the core dependence that the Congress works, worries about. It's a way to restore the system and to give Congress a chance to at least be a little bit more trusted than King George the third. Okay, now that's the argument. Here's the challenge. How do we bring it about? I don't think it's hard 
to see the problem. All of us saw the problem long before anything I said tonight. And it's not even hard to describe a solution. I think once you work through the mechanics of how these solutions could work, it's easy to see why indeed they could work. What's hard, what's maybe impossibly hard, is to imagine bringing that solution about, to imagine the political movement that could actually create it. Because there's a deep conflict at the core of this problem, and the conflict lives within the beltway that is Washington, D.C. As Jim Cooper, Democrat from Virginia, who's been in Congress as long as all but about 20 members of Congress told me, the problem with Congress today is that Capitol Hill is now a, quote, farm league for K Street. <laughs> members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model in their head, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So public citizen calculated between 1998 and 2004, 50% of senators left to become lobbyists, 42% of members of the House. Those numbers are only higher today. So that everyone within that beltway depends upon the system surviving because only if it survives will they have the chance to cash out and make the money they can make as high-priced lobbyists. So how in a world where the only policymakers we've got depend upon the system surviving, how could we possibly change that system? Now in my book I describe the four possible ways to change it. One is the ordinary way. It's also impossible to imagine the ordinary way working. That's the statute. No statute will be passed because this Congress is not going to cure itself. That forces me to then talk about really three insane ideas, which <laughs> turns out are just merely improbable, not impossible. And maybe the most insane, but I think ultimately the one that is the only way out, is to turn to the tool the framers of our Constitution gave us in the provision of the Constitution that governs amending the Constitution, Article 5. The framers gave us two ways to amend. The standard way is that Congress proposes an amendment, which then has to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. But the framers were worried, what if Congress is the problem? They're not going to propose an amendment to cure themselves. So they gave a second way to propose amendments to the Constitution. This is that the states call on Congress to call a convention, and the convention then proposes amendments, which then in the same way have to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. 38 states would have to ratify the convention, the, the amendments to the Constitution. Now, this convention strategy and the other two strategies, the other two insane strategies I described, these are all ways around the cancer that has become Washington, D.C. Right? And the key here, the insight here, is that we need to recognize something that's very difficult to accept, that these ordinary means of reforming our government won't work in these extraordinary times. What these extraordinary times require is that we do something we have not done in a very long time. That we find a way to build a politics that is different from the politics of the 20th century. This passive, consuming politics where we took the orders from the professionals and reacted in the way that passive consumers react. Instead, we need a politics that's active and engaged and one that we as citizens, not as politicians, own. Now, we don't know, I don't know, whether we can do it. It's not clear to me that any of the strategies for overcoming, for, for cutting out this cancer is possible. But what we do know is how it starts. And in my view, it starts with two elements. Number one, it starts with a certain clarity, the clarity of Thoreau, the clarity of a root striker. So it's not surprising that Occupy Seattle has one of the coolest websites of all the Occupy movements. <laughs> but it's also not surprising that if you list, look at their demands that they're considering, it's this endless list of demands from protecting to the environment to my favorite, 
ending the industrial prison complex. <laughs> now the point here is that we need to recognize that all of us have to celebrate the diversity in views of this nation, both views among people on the left, but views across all of us as citizens in this nation. And by celebrating the diversity of views, that does not mean compromising your principles. Indeed, I think we on the left especially need to find a way to stick to our principles firmly in the face of those who disagree with us, to argue for, I'm a liberal, my liberal views, I want a chance to defend absolutely. But there's nothing inconsistent with sticking to your principles and seeking common ground with fellow citizens who disagree with you. So in these movements, these Occupy movements, I think there needs to be an exercise. I think they need to articulate what we on the left believe and ask the Tea Party to articulate what we on the right believe. But then ask the question whether there isn't a fundamental set of beliefs which we, all of us, believe. And if it's framed like that, where we're not asking you to give up your beliefs, we're asking you, is there something we can agree upon? Then I think that if we can get people to focus, to connect the dots on the wide range of issues that frustrate all of us, those of us on the left, healthcare reform, people on the right, government bailouts, those on the left, global warming, people on the right, the complex task system, those on the left, the financial reform, those on the right, financial reform. The point is, if we can get them to focus on these, we begin to identify a root cause, and all of us, whether from the left or the right, should recognize this picture as the root cause of our problems. And if we can inspire people in these movements to be root strikers, then these root strikers can get us all to see this common, clear problem. And number two, we need courage. So Arnold Hyatt is a friend in this movement. He's also very humble. This is the smallest, this is the biggest picture I could find of him on the internet. <laughs> he was a president of Stride Right, makes great shoes like Ted's. Um, and he's also a loyal Democrat. 1996, he was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. So in 1997, Bill Clinton invited him and a bunch of other large contributors to a dinner at the Mayflower Hotel. So it was a dinner for these fat cats, 30 of them. <laughs> and the president asked each of these fat cats to tell him what he should be doing in the balance of his administration. We don't have any pictures from the event. Each of them got up and spoke. Arnold was the last one to speak. I kind of envision it like this. He stands up <laughs> and he looks the president straight in the eye and he says, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I want you to put yourself in Roosevelt's shoes in 1940 when he reluctantly came to recognize that he needed to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. He said, you too, Mr. President, you need to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, but in an important sense, a war against fat cats. A war against people like us, people who believe that merely because we are wealthy, we are entitled to direct government policy. Merely because we've been successful in the marketplace, we are entitled to get the president on the other end of the phone. People who have convinced America that democracy does not work. Now you can imagine in that room of 30 fat cats and the president, after he was finished, there was a little bit of silence, uncomfortable shuffling in the room. The only published account we have of the evening says, quote, Clinton's response effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group. Now, I think 14 years later, we need to recognize that it was Hyatt who was right that evening, that we do need to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. But where Arnold was wrong, was in believing it would be politicians who would wage that war 
It's not going to be politicians. It's going to be citizens. It's going to be us. It's going to be root strikers. It's going to be you. It's our job. It requires our courage. It is our republic here that has been lost. Ours, not theirs. They took it away, but because we let them. And I want to end with one more story. So I'm sure most of you remember this extraordinary event in March of 1989 when a ship under the command of Captain Joseph Hazelwood ran aground and spilled some 11 million gallons of oil into the Prince William Sound. This is Captain Hazelwood calling in the accident. Yeah, uh, it's back here. Uh, Uh, if you want, uh, so you're notified over. <clears throat> now, as I'm sure many of you are wondering, there was a pretty substantial question about whether Captain Hazelwood had been drinking that night. <laughs> he said he had only had four vodkas before he got onto the ship, um, but his blood alcohol level the next morning said that he must have been at least six times the legal limit when he got on board. But he denied it. There was a huge fight about it. His lawyers litigated it very vigorously, and in the end, he was not convicted of being intoxicated at the time that he was captaining the supertanker. So let's say there's some doubt, some doubt about whether he was drunk. What there was no doubt about was that he had a problem with alcohol. His mother testified that he had had a problem with alcohol in the past. 1985, four years before the accident, Exxon had treated him for his problem with alcohol. After the Exxon, after the accident, the president said that he thought that Hazelwood had mastered his problem. But in 1986, his driver's license had been revoked for driving under the influence. And in 1988, his driver's license had been revoked for driving under the influence. At the time he was captaining a supertanker, he was not allowed to drive a VW Beetle. <laughs> OK, but forget for a minute Captain Hazelwood. He's not my target. I want you to think about those around Captain Hazelwood, the other officers who could have picked up a phone. While a drunk was driving a super tanker, I want you to think about those people who did nothing, because all of them except one did nothing. What do we think about them? Now, I ask that question because as I think about the problems that we face now, I increasingly believe we are they. The critical problems in our society requiring serious attention, yet we have institutions incapable of that attention. They are distracted, distracted by the wrong dependencies, unable to focus, like a pilot playing on a laptop rather than filing, flying the airplane, or a surgeon flirting during surgery, or half of you on your cell phone when you're driving. We face these critical problems requiring serious attention, but none of the institutions that are supposed to give them this attention can do it. And who is to blame for that? Who is responsible for that? I think we should not focus on the Rob Lagojeviches in this story. We should not focus on the evil people. We need to think more about the good people, the decent people, the people who could have picked up a phone, us. For we, the most privileged, are responsible for fixing this. Because the most outrageous part is that the corruptions I've described here may have been primed by the most privileged, but they have been permitted by the passivity of the most privileged as well. Permitted. When Ben Franklin was carried from the Constitutional Convention in 1787, he was asked by a woman, 
Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? And Franklin said, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. A republic, a representative democracy, a government dependent upon the people alone. We have lost that republic. And all of us have to act now to get it back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you get the lights up a little bit? Great. Thank you very much. That's very sweet. Thank you. So what do you mean by a secondary group? Like all the PACs and all the, all the other groups that sort of put on these exterior ads for campaigns, mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. the NRA and all these you know, supposedly issue-oriented groups, but mostly like the NRA is sort of another branch of the Republican. I, I think the fact we got to confront is that living in a democracy, or a republic as the conservatives like to call it, but a representative democracy um, we're going to lose, hopefully, half the time, you know, or some proportion of the time. And if this system of public funding actually encourages lots of people to band together with their small dollar contributions in a way that forces us to lose, I, I just think we have to accept this is the way a democracy functions. Now, I, so in the system I described in my book, um, which is a little different from the Maine and Connecticut and uh, Arizona system, everybody would be given the first $50 of tax revenue back as a democracy voucher. So the first $50 you've sent to Washington, you get back as a democracy voucher. And you can give that democracy voucher to any candidate who agrees to fund his or her campaign only through democracy vouchers or contributions up to $100. No PAC money, no large contributions, just small dollar contributions. Now $50 to every voter produces $6 billion in an election cycle. $6 billion is about two and a half times the total amount raised and spent in the last congressional election. So it's real money. But it does create this opportunity that if, for example, unions or the NRA can get their members to band together to direct their funds towards one candidate or another, then those entities have some kind of influence that otherwise they might not have as much of. And my response is, anybody who can convince citizens to do something in the name of politics deserves that authority. The difference between that, though, and the system we've got right now is it's hundreds of thousands of people they have to convince, as opposed to the system right now where it's 0.05% of the population that has to be convinced one way or another to drive the elections. So we could have banding together, true. It could produce results some of us don't like. It will. But it at least has the authority of the dependence related to the banding together of people as opposed to a small set of funders who are not the people. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I was wondering if you could uh, clarify your position on the Citizens United. I heard you saying that it should be sort of the focus of people's concern yeah. at this point. Right, so Citizens United was a terrible decision, January 20th, 2010, which held that corporations could spend unlimited amounts of money in independent political expenditures. So just like individuals had been held in Buckley versus Vallejo to have that liberty, so too corporations have that liberty. And that excited an extraordinary movement of people who wanted to overturn Citizens United. Some people calling for an amendment to overturn Citizens United, other people calling for an amendment that says corporations are not persons. And my reaction to that reaction was mixed. Because on the one hand, the decision in Citizens United, I think, is terrible. And I'm enormously excited by a political movement that grows up in response. But on the other hand, if all we do is to achieve the reversal of Citizens United, we haven't achieved anything. 
Because the fact is, on January 20th, 2010, the day before Citizens United was decided, our democracy was already broken. So fixing Citizens United is not the way to fix this democracy. So I think the way to fix, you know, ultimately, in addition to the kind of public funding that I've described, I think we ultimately have to have constitutional change. And in my view, constitutional, constitutional change has three components. Number one, a requirement that we publicly fund public elections. Number two, a limit on contributions. And I take Buddy Romer's $100 as the limit, $100 limit. Because I think, I don't want to get all money out of politics. I think it's a good thing if people give money that makes them committed to the candidate, it gets them active, participation is important. But we just have to make a number that's not going to be so significant that anybody could believe that it was driving policy because of that number. So maximum contribution of $100. And number three, Congress has to have the power to limit but not to ban independent expenditures by both corporations and citizens, by everybody. So that everybody has a chance to get their view out, but nobody has the right to dominate a political election so that the candidates are not just shape-shifting to get the contributions they want, but also shape-shifting to encourage the right kind of independent expenditures in their campaigns. It's obvious to all of us that that's what happens. Not to the Supreme Court, so we're, you know, I don't know quite why we're more insightful about this than the Supreme Court is about it, but, um, but they were fundamentally misguided in that uh, understanding. Um, so if we had the power to limit independent expenditures and limited contributions and publicly funded elections, I think we get everything we need in reform. Now some people say, and we should say corporations are not persons. And I say, okay, fine. So lawyer, I don't quite get what's so significant about that, but okay, fine. But just don't make corporations are not persons the reform. Let's make it number four. Or I'll say number one in a list of four that includes my only other three. But let's make sure we get real reform that really makes it so that the funders are not a small slice of America that continue to direct public policy in a way America doesn't want. Yeah. In watching the comments that people are making, it seems that these are all people who want to get something done here, but each of them are going in there with how this thing is gonna be written, which we can't write it right now, and how they can address their own personal issues on this. So you're talking about uh, Dylan Radigan's Get Money Out That's campaign. Right. So you're talking about people's comments about his amendment. That's correct. Right, okay. And what I have observed over the years is basically there's two types of issues out there go in front of Congress. One has to do with money, generally, and the other has to do with emotion and religion. So if we set aside the emotion and religion and ask the people about their money issues, or these issues that we see, and have them look at what the seed is for that issue, as you say, it's money. And what I'd like to see us do is to somehow get people together with a campaign that basically says, to make 2012 a one-issue election. Hmm. Yeah, so Set all of those others aside. Say, I'll wait for the next election for those, but we'll face this one <coughs> important issue. Yeah, so I completely agree with you, and I would love 2012 to be a single-issue election, partly because I like historical symmetry. So 1912 turned out to be a single issue election, whether progressivism would prevail. And the progressives in 1912 were of many different political stripes. The two presidential candidates, both self-described progressives, TR, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, were very different on a whole bunch of issues. But the one issue they agreed on was the deep corruption of the political system at the time. And progressivism in this cross partisan way was an agreement about the need to address that corruption. Um, and in that election, 70% of Americans voted for one of these two progressives. Wilson won, but 70% between the two. So I think there are these moments where we wake up enough to unite in a single issue way. And in 1912, of course, the corruption was different from the corruption we're talking about, but it still is, I think, an ins inspiration, a signal. But the problem is, you know, there is one presidential candidate right now who is making money the issue. Republican candidate Buddy Romer, 
taking no more than $100 from anybody, taking no PAC money, and disclosing every contribution. He is a governor from, Virginia, from uh, Louisiana, four-term congressman for Louisiana, spent 20 years in private sector building a bank, a community bank that took no money from the government. So a successful politician, successful businessman. But he's been completely written off in the Republican primaries, partly because people say there's no possible way you could win <laughs> taking $100 only from anybody. So he hasn't even been allowed to be in the debates to place this issue at the center of the Republican debates. Now, I'm a Democrat, uh, and I worked hard to elect Barack Obama, and Barack Obama was a colleague of mine in Chicago, and I had deep respect and love for him as a person. Um, but I, as you will see in the book, if you read the book, more important to buy the book, but if you read the book, um, <laughs> I'm extraordinarily disappointed in Barack Obama. You know, I think the only reason he was entitled to the nomination over Hillary Clinton was that he made reform the issue. Take up the fight to change the way Washington works. That was, the, and Hillary is like, you know, at a Gigli Coast conference, she had this wonderful exchange about lobbyists. Lobbyists are people too. They represent real people too. There's no problem with the system. So he, her view was not, we gotta change the system. It was just gotta run the system to get the most we can out of it. And Barack Obama became Hillary Clinton on January 20th, 2009. He ran his administration the way she would have run her administration. Now, I think if she were president, we should say of her, she did a great job. You know, you got as much as you could get out of this system. It was a hard th way to fight in this system. But of him, we should say, this is a betrayal. You, you know, we are Charlie Brown, you are Lucy. You are the latest in a series of Lucys who's told us you were gonna reform the system and you didn't. So, I can't imagine voting for anybody except for Barack Obama, except, <laughs> If Buddy is the candidate on the Republican side, I'm gonna be out there fighting as hard as I can. Because imagine if it were the Republican who was saying money is corrupting the system. You listen to his rhetoric and you cannot, you cannot see in his rhetoric about money anything I think to disagree with. Now his policies scare me, you know. You know he's, a, he's a right wing Republican, you know. I was, a, I was the youngest member of a delegation in the 1980 Reagan convention, right? So as a kid, I was a right-wing Republican. I grew up, but you know, as a kid, I was a right-wing Republican. Um, I'm not anymore, so I, I'm scared about that, but I have exactly your sense.